I did my arms too. By the way, where was Einstein born? On what date? You say, well, I didn't know, but I can look it up. So, your mind palace is your bookcase. Part of it you can see over there, which is mine. And uh, so, you know, you can look some things up, and that's the power of print. The huge value of being able to read anything, and you can learn any Everything is open to you, so long as your intellect can grasp it. And that's what education is. We are the species on Earth that takes longest to grow up. Hello and welcome to the Aspects of History podcast. My name is Oliver Webb Carter and I'm the editor and your host. Today I welcome Paul Strathern onto the pod to discuss the Renaissance, or to be exact, the other Renaissance. Paul has written a new book focusing not on the Italian Renaissance, but on that which took place further north, in the Holy Roman Empire, the Low Countries, France and England. So we talk about Martin Luther and Protestantism, Copernicus and the orbit of the sun, and Gutenberg and the printing press. We also go on to talk about a wonderful fellow Paracelsus, to some the father of medicine, to others a quack. Paul himself has written many books on lots of different subjects, such as the history of economics, Napoleon in Egypt, the Borgias and the Florentines. So there is unlikely to be anything he doesn't know. Now Paul's voice is a little hoarse these days, but I do hope you can indulge him because what he has to say is endlessly fascinating. Coming up, I've got Napoleon's invasion of Russia, the revolutions of 1848, the Battle of Cressy with Gordon Corrigan, and much, much more. If you get the chance, listen back to my recent Film Club podcast with director Tim Hewitt talking about Ben Affleck's Argo, the Iranian Revolution set thriller. Next month, we're doing the financial crash films The Big Short and Margin Call. In the meantime, I'll hand you over to me talking to Paul Strathern. Paul Strathern, welcome. It's a real pleasure to speak to you about your new book, The Other Renaissance, from Copernicus to Shakespeare. So welcome. Thank you. Uh, Now, I wanted to, because I'm certainly not an expert in this field, and you most certainly are having written, I mean, this is a follow on from your previous book, The Florentines. And yeah. Um, and I actually you're all, something of a Renaissance man yourself, having been a philosopher, well, having uh, taught philosophy and mathematics and and written books of, of across all different subjects. But I wanted to kick things off with rather a, a kind of mundane, maybe even annoying question, which is uh, this is the this book is entitled The Other Renaissance. But I was thinking, you know, I'm, I'm aware of what the Renaissance is. But what's the best way to to describe what it is? Well, the Renaissance, most people tend to think of the Renaissance as being, well, certainly centred in Italy um, and art and going around Florence. And when you think of the Renaissance, you tend to think of names like Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, Lorenzo de' Medici, and this is tends to emphasise Italian artistic, and also it gets to Galileo in science, but um, uh, a lot went on in the north, which tends to be overlooked, I think, a little bit. So, I mean, you could call this book the Northern Renaissance, but that makes it sound more of a textbook, and I've wanted it to refer popularly to the other Renaissance. And it tends to mention, as I say, the artists of the Northern Renaissance who actually introduced oil painting into Italy. Um, You know, um, Botticelli, for instance, and Leonardo, they all tended to work in fresco. And it's only later that they came to use... um, oil painting, which is much more subtle and can be retouched, whereas fresco is painted straight onto a wall, and when it dries, that's why fresco meaning fresh, when it dries, that's it. 
Um, you can touch it up a bit, but uh, it's, um, it's rather more, you know, you have to do it at once. I mean, that's why it brings up radiant colours of Botticelli, for instance. But uh, Leonardo was able, when he went into oil painting, to paint, for instance, uh, the Giaconda, the Mona Lisa, and he went on repainting that all of his life because it, he could do this with oil, um, which he couldn't do with his other paintings. Anyway, he, in many ways, brought the Italian Renaissance to Northern Europe when the King of France invited him to live in France and gave him a small chateau near his own. And uh, Leonardo was aging in those days and was towards the end of, well, the end of his life, in fact. And it's generally seen as Francis I bringing the Southern Renaissance through to the North. Sort of in symbolic, in, in, in real terms and in symbolic terms. Because there was a Renaissance going on in Europe, of course in the way that um, oil painting was there. And the main thing is the Northern Renaissance can be put down in three things. I would think Luther and the Reformation, Copernicus and the heliocentric idea of the universe and the oil painting of Van Eyck. Three different departments sort of epitomized the Renaissance north of the Alps. Um, the Renaissance south of the Alps was financed and promulgated by the Medici family, who spent their money on it. They were a banking family, but they were beyond their prime in banking. And they'd taken over as the rulers of Florence. Now, of the equivalent in the Northern Renaissance, the other Renaissance, was the Fago family of Germany, who were in many ways much more rich than the um, Medici, and their interests extended from, well, Austria across Northern Europe to Spain. They financed the Holy Roman Emperor, and they also in so doing, financed much of the art that was going on. And uh, um, the Fugger, Jacob Fugger the Rich, was the one who helped finance the Holy Roman Emperor and therefore sort of financed the, you know, much of the Renaissance activities that were going on in that time. Um, quite aside from this scientific renaissance beyond to permeate Northern Europe, as we say, the, on its own, you had the Copernicus and you had Erasmus, who was the great scholar. And he was the great humanist scholar. And humanist philosophy was in many ways the, um, the sort of spark for the Renaissance. It changed um, philosophical thinking to thinking about classical, ancient philosophy and thought and art, um, which was in its own way irreligious and it was um, Pagan, I mean, Roman, ancient Greek philosophy had philosophy, but the idea of God as such was, uh, let's put it this way, light on the ground. It wasn't central. The idea, central idea, was that humanity was central. Human thought, the human being was central. And this was central to... Um, humanism of the Renaissance, which 
was present in South and the North. In the North and South, it was joined by, um, I would say, Erasmus, who was the main thinker of this. And uh, he travelled, he was Dutch, travelled to all parts of Europe. But his great friend was um, Thomas More in London, who was the right-hand man of uh, Henry VIII and uh, was in fact his general factotum, uh, right-hand man. And this was a dangerous position. In England at the time, his sponsor was Cardinal Wolsey, who fell foul of Henry VIII and was executed. Thomas More was took over from Wolsey, yeah. And, uh, of course, in the end, suffered the same fate as him. He was beheaded. He fell foul of Henry VIII. In depth, Thomas More is dealt with brilliantly, of course, by the novels of her... Uh, and Henry Mantel. Yeah, well, I was going to ask you about that, actually, because the Thomas More in Hilary Mantel is is not quite the sort of character you see in The Man for All Seasons, where he's this wonderfully yeah. noble figure, but he's he's less less noble in, in the Hilary Mantel novels. That's true. You had to, to stay alive if you were ambitious. You got to the top and... There were many people plotting against you. I mean, the, the period that Henry VIII went through was a great period of change. Henry himself broke with the Roman Church, having previously been a defender of the faith, which is why on our coins we still have the ruler of our country has fed Death, written on which is Defender of the Faith, and that um, was a title given by the Pope to Henry VIII. And when he broke with Rome and set up the Church of England, he kept this title, which is why it remains on our coins. And uh, even Elizabeth II, and presumably Charles III's coins, which are coming out soon. Uh, have they come out yet? I don't know. I don't think they've come just yet, have they? No. No. Maybe in time for the coronation. Yes, perhaps. Um, Anyway, the the, uh, stamps have come out, but uh, that's aside from um, it after the the Northern Renaissance. I I was going to ask you about the Reformation, but I'm glad we've got to that now. So the Reformation, I, I guess that encouraged the sort of the other Renaissance Martin Luther, I suppose, earlier. But without Martin Luther, would you have had such a powerful other renaissance? You wouldn't, would you? No, I don't think so, because Martin Luther split Europe. Almost north and south, didn't he? It was north and south. Well, it was to a certain extent. But as I say, politics at that time was very much a, a moving. Tectonic shifts were taking place. France was the greatest nation in Europe. The Holy Roman Empire was another powerful force. And a part of the Holy Roman Empire were the German states, which were many and varied, some of which became Protestant, other, others of which remained Catholic. Um, the sort of deciding role in this came at the end of the um, Northern Renaissance, when Europe destroyed itself in the Thirty Years' War. Now, the Thirty Years' War was initially Protestants against Catholic. Now, the most powerful Catholic nation was France, and the most powerful Protestant empire was the Holy Roman Empire. But when it became obvious that the Holy Roman Empire was doing so well, France decided, knowing that if the Holy Roman Empire succeeded, it would become the most powerful force in Europe. It decided to um, join up with Protestant Sweden and therefore blocked the power 
of the Holy Roman Empire. So the, the balance of power was re- restrained by Catholic France joining Protestant Sweden. So that when the end came, Europe still had a balance. And um, France was held in check. So you had two, two parts. Uh, vaguely Protestant Holy Roman Empire and um, Catholic France. Now, this this brought about the end of the this came at the end of the uh, the Renaissance because it, it in many ways destroyed Europe. Uh, but so the troubles in Europe were going apace on towards this throughout the Northern Renaissance, the other Renaissance. Um, quite obviously, things were breaking up. It's a very interesting p- parallel that the Renaissance, which echoes classical world, especially of ancient Greece, which consisted of warring states. No, you had the same position. Warring states in Italy, in the Southern Renaissance, and in Northern Europe. It seems that this breaking up of a hegemony brought about new ways of thinking and war, of course, and new ways of thought. I mean, the change of um, Copernicus from the world being the centre of the universe to the sun being the centre of the universe was a tremendous difference. I mean, it, it turned everything on its head. It was an idea, but it changed humanity's view of itself. Humanity was no longer centre of the universe, answerable to God, who was in charge. And uh, so the spirituality of the of the pre-Renaissance, medieval era, which was our reward is in heaven. And our, this is for our behaviour, our spiritual behaviour on this earth. We will be judged in heaven, judged, judged when we die, when we either go to hell, go to purgatory, purged of our sins, and then go to, hell, to paradise. Now this, especially purgatory, was being put forward by the popes at the time, especially the um, Medici Pope, Pope Pius, um, who had people selling um, you know, dispensations. So you spent, you could buy it. So you, when you died, you spent less time in purgatory and went quicker to heaven. Now this was quite obviously just a nonsense to, well, to Luther at any rate. And he challenged this. <clears throat> and many people who realized this was just supporting the Renaissance popes who were building the great buildings of Rome, which cost a fortune. Uh, St. Peter's in Rome, and they were, you know, sponsoring the great artists to, to create St. Peter's and Sistine Chapel and the painting of Sistine Chapel, all the great work of the Renaissance was sponsored by this money which was being coming from from the uh, well, the selling of dispensation for your time in purgatory. And uh, this was um, well, it annoyed a lot of people. It it's draining. a bit of a racket. It's a bit of a racket. And to us now it seems a racket. And to Luther it seemed a racket. Um, and it obviously was a racket. But uh, it was a racket which was Strongly supported, you didn't go against the church. You, in fact, you went against the church at your peril. And Luther would not have su- survived, but for the support of p- powerful princes in the region. You know, he was in danger of his life if he hadn't been supported by, you know, by powerful forces who saw it in their power and saw it in their interest to, well, to support Luther, lessen the, the um, power of the church, and therefore increase their own power. And, as I say, this helped the 
power, the freedom and power of um, Northern Europe um, and brought into being the, well, France retained its power, but they brought into power the power of England and the Dutch Netherlands, which gradually broke away from the Holy Roman Empire, which in fact, in the form of Spain, owned the Netherlands. And it was the, you know, the breaking away that brought about the great Dutch art and the great English art. And um, when England broke away from the church, I mean, Henry VIII broke away from the church and the time of Henry gave way to the Elizabethan age, which was England's great period, and hence this time I put the end of time as Shakespeare. I mean, you, you had Copernicus, who dislodged humanity from the centre of the universe, and this gave way to many great artists. I mean, Spain had great artists, and England had its own great artists. In the film, often imported ones, such as Holbein, from, you know, whose great portraits, oh, they have Henry VIII's. I mean, that's how Henry VIII was brought to life, to us. Our image. Well, yes, our, our image of that whole period is, is thanks to Holbein. Yes. Holbein is the young Henry, the great athletic figure, and the old and bloated, um, which is cunningly disguised. But if you look hard, you see that this is a man deeply gone to seed. His stomach is enormous. But of course, the portraits are taken from the front, so you only get a suggestion of this, you know, figure. But, so, Paul, uh, you've, mentioned, you've mentioned Copernicus, and I yeah. just wanted to know how revolutionary... I mean, obviously, it's a revolutionary hypothesis that he could prove that the Earth... Uh, orbited the sun but was he confirming what many believed or uh, or how revolutionary was copernicus's theory several ancient greek philosophers had posited a heliocentric universe many ideas like that flourished in greece but the Co copernicus was the first for many years, for many centuries, this idea had been put forward, but uh, rejected. And Copernicus was, in fact, um, a priest, um, a lay priest. He was a minor order. He was um, so he didn't want his book to go against the teaching of the, of the church, which was sacrosanct, because it was based on the ideas of Ptolemy, which had been accepted by Aristotle, and the teachings of Aristotle became the intellectual foundations of the teaching of the church. Not just Aristotle, but Galen, the Greek Roman um, medical theorist and practitioner, of course. So when they became formalized, it became Aristotle's ideas became the Holy Writ. So Ptolemy, very ingeniously, had the Earth as the centre of the universe and the other things circled about the Earth, as they do seem to do. If we look in the Earth and we, we stand and we look and we examine the stars, they do appear to pass across the heavens in circles. So... In many ways, in science, if you look at it from a scientific point of view, well, this is science as it is practiced. Science describes what happens. You see the stars and the planets going across heavens in circular fashion. Now, this involves an incredibly complicated in centric circles. If you place the sun at the center, it suddenly becomes obvious that you have much more simple circles. Now this is a much simpler hypothesis. 
Um, that doesn't mean that Ptolemy was wrong. It meant he didn't, his explanation wasn't as good. Because although it described the truth as, in, as we saw it, standing where we saw it, it was right, it was true. But when you change the universe and you realize that we are not the center of the universe, then you have these circles. Now, that's why science moves. Science moves by describing what we see, which always remains the same. We describe it in more detail. And thus, where certain ancient hypotheses have to be discarded, because they're not quite right. Um, and indeed, Copernicus described center being the sun and the planets circling the earth in circular orbits. Later, you would get Kepler, who understood perfectly well the ideas, as indeed did Galileo, the ideas, the heliocentric ideas of Copernicus, but he understood that these weren't quite right. They the orbits that went around the sun were elliptical. And so, again, you have an improvement. You have a hypothesis, and then you have closer examination. You get an improvement, and that's how science works. It works all the way through time, because it's observation. And you, from this observation, you make a, a theory. This theory doesn't quite describe everything. You look a bit closer, and it goes wrong. And this, then you get a further theory, exactly the same as Newton described gravity. And this described why and how the planets moved around the, um, the through the Earth. He also described gravity as, this is why, how everything, how I dropped the pencil, it falls because it attracted to the larger body of the Earth. This works. And then later you get Einstein, who described other further examinations, which accounted for tiny anomalies in Newton's thought. And then you get quantum theory, which explains tiny anomalies in Newtonian and, and Einstein's thought. So more and more you get closer and closer observation. None of it is um, yes, it's wrong. Um, the first observations, if what you see are correct, but they're you know they're, they're a bit blurred. You can't see everything perfectly without a telescope, which is why the great expansion that Copernicus saw and you know, was improved upon by Kepler, was improved upon not with a telescope, because the telescope had not been invented. Well, it had been invented, but it wasn't used. Um, it was used by the observations of an amazing man called Tio Brahe, a Danish astronomer, who literally, with his own eyes, took an enormous amount of observations of the stars. And this enabled Kepler to trace, realize that the stars, the planets circling around the planet didn't precisely follow a circle, but they uh, tra traveled an ellipse. And that's how science advances, and that's how scientists who use observation and the beginning of this observation of the original science was, of course, Galileo. But many of Galileo's best disciples, so to speak, were in the north. And um, they um, they came in Elizabethan England. Sir Francis Bacon uh, is the classic example in Britain. And uh, you've got Brian Kepler, um, Brian's observations, and Kepler's Kepler's some reading of the observations. Kepler was strange because he 
from these minute observations of Brahe, he traced out the beautiful elliptical orbits of the planets. But he remained, in many ways, medieval in the way that he was a mystic and believed in the perfection of the universe and that it had to obey certain mystical laws. And he, he put these beautiful elliptical orbits into a platonic Plato's idea of the universe. So they were encased in solids. They followed this sort of strange mystic mixture. Although he followed the exact observations, he retained um, ancient mystical ideas. And these sort of, what do I call, superstitious ideas, um, this, they seem easy, they seem obviously superstitious and maybe wrong to us, but they, when they look at us, in only a hundred years' time, many of our ideas will appear equally fanciful and based on um, superstition, perhaps, uh, you know, um, mistaken observation or over-theorizing. I mean, nowadays we have um, string theory, which is theorizing upon theorizing upon theorizing, and we have no observation. No one has ever seen a string. It's string like tiny, or it's likely to, well, maybe they will in 50 years' time, maybe 100. They're so tiny that uh, they are as tiny as an atom in the universe. Can you imagine us seeing an atom? No, an atom in the solar system. I'm sorry. Seeing an atom. So no, I can't. They're that, I can't. They're that small. You know, that yeah. tiny. Well, I mean, each no. era, each era always thinks, each generation or era always thinks we are the peak. And yes. assumes um, there's yeah, um, nothing further to go. Well, yeah, that's true to a certain extent. We now realise that, you know, that we are putting forward hypotheses that are going to be um, overcome. But you're quite right. That's exactly how, for instance, um, <clears throat> who, who is it? Planck, who thought of quantum theory in 1900, when he went into science, he became a physicist, and he was very bright, and he was told by the great German physicists pre-1900, when he was a student, oh, he said, they was told, physics is finished, it's been explained. It's There's only a bit of mopping up, only mopping up to be done. There's only measurements, only what they call stamp collecting. You know, you've got to find out, you know, how dense is carbon, how many atoms there are. There's only mopping up to that. The whole theory, it's all been explained. And then he came across this amazing observation, which brought about quantum theory. And he didn't really believe it himself. It just, he thought it was an anomaly. And Einstein five years later, came across sort of trying to explain this anomaly. And they came up with this idea of quantum theory, which began, was so peculiar. In the end, Einstein gave it. His, Einstein, at the end of his life, that it can't possibly be true. This is too complicated, too filled with probability and randomness. There must be an underlying theory beneath this, which explains it. It can't possibly be true. So these people who began to discover this theory didn't believe it. And well, well, sorry, we sorry, sorry to interrupt you. Um, what, what, yes, <clears throat> excuse me. I'm the one sorry. who should be called. My, <laughs> this is, um, my voice is permanently like this, and it's uh, what I refer to as my, my mafia voice. <laughs> yes, of course. I make you... An offer you can't refuse. <laughs> <laughs> well, your book opens with a hilarious fellow, Paracelsus, who yes. <laughs> is a fascinating character. Now, he's a, a scientist, and but he has rather a unique way of proving to his audience his, his latest theory. 
uh, yes. which you open your book with. But I found him a very interesting character. And I wondered if you could just talk a little bit about him. He's quite, he's quite, uh, he opens your book and you've got a chapter devoted to him as well, haven't you? He's a marvellous character. He is a beautiful blend of scientific observation. And um, his real name was Von Bombastus. And although the word bombastic doesn't come from his original name, he was a totally bombastic character. It describes him. He was larger than life. Um, he um, drank too much. He talked too much. He behaved badly. And he was a constant rebel, which is why he could never get it into academic life because they wouldn't tolerate him. Um, I opened the book with the one time when he did manage to get into um, academic life, he met um, the great philosopher of his time, Erasmus, the great historian, and cured him of kidney complaints. Now, um, Paracelsus, as he called himself, which means above Celsus, Celsus was the rediscovered great Roman medical his works have been republished in the Renaissance and they realised that he was one of the great medical men of the Renaissance period. Now, uh, Paracelsus immediately claimed that he was greater than Celsus so he called himself Paracelsus um, and he said he went to a certain university we can't find any real um, object, we can't find any evidence that he went to university he probably did, and was probably expelled. But uh, the university he claims to have gone to in Italy, the records of that particular period are vanished, are, mi are missing. So he knew well enough. So he probably knew that at the time. But uh, So he then spent his life travelling all over Europe, earning his living as a travelling medical man. Now, he learnt old wives' tales and witches practices and many of the myths and things which they were false but some many were true many of the herbs were used were true and they did cure people so the ones that worked he stuck with and when he came to um he theorized on this so he was a very successful um doctor and the when i opened the book he just treated Erasmus, and Erasmus had a word with the university authorities, and he said, look, this man is the best doctor you could possibly have. Make him professor of medicine. And because the great Erasmus said, make him president of medicine, the university authorities agreed. And Paracelsus had a central theory behind much of his um, deep and profound um, external knowledge on cures. They had thought the idea, the idea of the behind medicine was that the human body was a chemical apparatus and it changed food which transpassed through the body and gave it strength and then came out the other end. Now, to explain this to the assembled worthies in the university, he opened his lecture by walking in, in, he wore an alchemist's leather outfit, which was, of course, outrageous, because in those days, the academics wore, wore gowns, and they were very pleased with it. He stormed in with a um, platter, covered platter, such as a waiter brings a great dish in a restaurant nowadays. He stormed in with it and said, I will now reveal to you the secret of all medicine. And he lifted the platter, and on it was a pile of steaming turds. And these were excrement. His, his point, in outraging everybody, was to show them that this was the chemistry. The human body took in nutrients. It was a chemical, chemical process, and it gave rise to this, and excreted the poisonous and the other elements that we don't need. This, of course, was a very profound point, 
Um, but uh, naturally, they didn't appreciate the way in which he made it. Students did, of course. He was always very popular with students. But um, with the academics, not quite so. Because in those days, academics had to struggle to be taken seriously. Um, and so you had to have dignity, as they do now. I mean, if you make a mess, you're expelled from... If you misbehave yourself too much, you're expelled from um, academia. Um, it happens to this day. I won't name any names, but there are... Um, a certain great historian in our lifetime at Oxford um, had tenure, but um, became so impossibly drunk um, that uh, he became an embarrassment. And so the authorities arranged for him to become a professor in a country I won't name. Uh, he went on with his work. How, how much he managed to cure himself from getting off, off the bottle, I don't know. But he remained a pretty, pretty damn good historian. And uh, his final works, he's dead now, but I won't name him. People can now hunt about and try and find his name. The um, cast of Oxford Dons of that era, who were not only very great and learned, but were completely alcoholic is quite large and varied. So, uh, <laughs> I'm not thinking think it's great you want to find that one out. So you can't have me up for uh, um, slander on that, on that term, call. <laughs> okay. Wonderful. Next um, question. <laughs> Paracelsus, is he... Because he's controversial even to this day, isn't he? Some people think yes. he is a bit of a quack. Yeah. Um, he was He was a man for drama, as you can see. From that thing. And when all else failed, he... He became a quack because, him, you know, he was wandering along the roads. And if he didn't earn a living, he starved. And often you arrive in town and the richest man in town wanted a horoscope told for himself and his wife uh, to show when they would have children. So he would make out a perfect horoscope for them and get paid for it. So he wasn't above doing um, certain things like that. He was also the father of certain alternative medicines, um, which uh, remain, um, let's say, uh, of deeper following. I won't name them, but your people will know. I mean, uh, deeper following in Germany, where they have a, a much deeper following for what you might call health medicines, health, you know, herbs and that sort of thing, alternative medicines. Um, Perhaps even England. our our present monarch. Uh, yes, yes. Um, I won't go so far as to say that he's a follower of Paracelsus. I mean, it's any stretch, but Paracelsus is taken as a very serious medical figure in Germany, and much more of a joke in England, in in what you might call the Anglo-Saxon world. In fact, there should be a quite certain swap over there. He should be taken a little less seriously in Germany and a little more seriously in Britain, I think. But, uh, yes. That's my, no, that's no, my I opinion. Think, I think that's quite right. And and you, <laughs> you've mentioned the Medicis and you do devote a chapter to Catherine de Medici, who's yeah. a, a very interesting woman. And, and the... She's present, and some might say a uh, certainly very inv- heavily involved in in an incident, the St Bartholomew Day's massacre. I wondered yeah. if you could just talk a little bit about that, because I always find that uh, particular event just fascinating, horrifying, but fascinating. <laughs> it is horrifying. It's fascinating. <clears throat> For those who don't know the full details of it. Um. France was going through riven with strife between Catholics and Protestants. The Protestants were the Huguenots. Catherine de Medici was the ruler. Well, she was the the mother of the ruler. And um, the Protestants, the Huguenots, were invited to Paris for a wedding. And to solve their problems. Now, I, <clears throat> how much she was responsible for the massacre of the Huguenots, which took place during this 
just before this wedding celebration, is a very moot point. Leonie Frieda, she read a marvellous book on um, Catherine de Medici, and I happened to be on the um, on the stand at Aon Y with her, and we both took in terms of, and we had this, and, Kath, and uh, Leonie was in the middle of this, talking about Catherine, and she had a very knowledgeable man who had a bee in his bonnet about St. Catherine's Day massacre, which is beautifully described in her book. I describe it obviously in less detail in mine. And she came to her own conclusion on it. This man's hobby horse was the massacre, symbolism, not the Day massacre, and he wouldn't have hard questions. So, in the end, we had to turn over to me, who didn't know anything at all about it at the time, and uh, get her out of a fix, because when someone has a, an idea that Catherine de Medici was utterly responsible for it, and there's overwhelming evidence, and you can't dissuade them. I think she certainly had a... It's difficult to say, um, and I hope I point that out, you know, well enough. In my book, I... I'd say it's etiquette, you know. Um, let's just say circumstances ran beyond her control. And uh, that's why the Huguenots um, then started to leave France. Well, they had been leaving France for a long time. They left mainly to Holland, where they had freedom of worship, and certainly to England. There are Huguenot houses in Spitalfields, where you can see them to this day. And... Uh, there are many names in Holland that sound French. And if ever you see the South African uh, rugby team, you may wa- maybe wonder why amongst the white players there are quite a few French names. Those names are Huguenot names from the ancient Huguenots who lived in in, um, in Holland. So when, they, when you see... Springbok players who have Huguenot names. Likewise, in Ireland, you have certain names which sound some French. They are from Huguenots who went to live in Ireland, in an Ireland was ruled by the Protestants. So, uh, just one of those things. And there's some beautiful old houses in Spitalfields, which you can see. They're old Dutch Huguenot ones. It's the Huguenots who came to Britain. Um, built and they're best you can still see them beautifully preserved we're coming to the end of our, our chat but there, there is and it's just such a fascinating so many things i could uh, talk about but i was thinking when i was reading the book that probably the most revolutionary and i guess i say this for selfish purposes given that mm. i'm in the world of books now it's gutenberg's invention of the printing press if you were to pick one, I mean, for me, it's, it would be Gutenberg. But but I wondered what you thought would be, if you had to pick a figure from the book, the most the three, influential. Three figures who made the most difference are quite obviously Luther, Copernicus and Gutenberg. Gutenberg made the printing press. It had been invented many years before in China, but he was the man who actually invented it in in Europe, the history of writing and books is fascinating. The earliest writing was on papyrus, of course. Um, and the Greeks, for instance, I think, I think Socrates was the first to say it. Socrates, who wrote nothing down, by the way. And Plato, who wrote everything about Socrates down. So that's all we know about him. And there was a belief that uh, writing down these ideas instead of memorizing them was the death of memory. Homer's Iliad was remembered and spoken by poets, um, by traveling, who remembered it from beginning to end. Our memory gets shorter and shorter. Um, Because with... um, Papyrus, all we need to do is read it. With a book, we can learn it, and then we can refer to it, like I had to refer just now to something I'd forgotten. But uh, so uh, it extends our learning enormously. 
I mean, but but, but both... so, j- just sorry to interrupt, but so that so their memory, particularly for the ancients, their their memories would would seem almost superhuman to us now. Then, yes, 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 many. Um, I mean, not all of them, of course, but I mean, a poet who would um, sit and recite Homer's Iliad, or even half of it. Um, it's quite a memory, quite a feat of memory, and that's because to do anything when you didn't have anything written down, you had to remember it. Now, when things were written down, you had it in scrolls, and this was why the Library Alexandria became um, famous, and then the one um, Pergamon became famous. They had scrolls, papyrus, the word papyrus comes from um, corruption in the word Pergamon, which is where they also had many papyruses, um, or one of the different. But the next great step was printing. Now, this meant that everyone who could read could see something. And it meant uh, that things could be very quickly, it meant that things could be printed not in Latin, which was the, the language of scholarship, but they could be printed in the language of the people. It's caused a tremendous... I mean, Tyndale was beheaded in England for translating the Bible into English. You know, um, the, the, there was a vested interest in the Catholic Church, particularly, in them explaining the Bible to their flock. Now, the whole idea of... Most of the idea of Protestantism was to get rid of the middleman speak directly to God. And that was that was an enormous re- um, revolution. And it meant a tremendous um, independence to the human mind. And we had, therefore, our own interpretation um, of God to this day. Not perhaps in Russia, but in other words, we believe in freedom of interpretation. And you've got to argue, argue your point against um, other intellectual points which are experienced, not theorised. But uh, this comes from books, and you'll be quoting a book. You'll be someone quoting a book against you. The ideas will come from the book. We won't do the experiments all the time. You've got a huge... That's where you have a reference. And we have the British Library now. Bibliothek Nacional. I mean, these, these are references to everything. You can go in there if you want. Yeah, I, you know, I could go in there and ask for the you know, first copy of Shakespeare's plays and uh, something that was written 600 years ago and I can tell you in half an hour in my hand and look at it and uh, exactly the same as the first man who owned it can look at it it's um, extraordinary and, uh, but that's what books bought books meant we could have a you, know, you get it in popular things Sherlock Holmes Especially the, what's his name? The uh, one with, who is the elder? Cumberbatch. Cumberbatch. He talks about his mind palace. Now that's when he has, he builds a library in his mind. And it's a method by which you keep, you place a certain memory in a certain place. Now, I don't have a mind palace. Some people do use that as a mnemonic idea to remember things. You perhaps don't have a mind, have a mind palace. But if I asked you, by the way, um, when, where was Einstein born? On what date? You say, well, I don't know, but I can look it up. So your mind palace is your bookcase. Part of it you can see over there, which is mine. And uh, so, you know, you can look some things up, and that's the power of print. You can, the huge, say nothing, entertainment, the huge value of being able to read anything. And you can learn more, more and more. And everything is open to you, so long as your intellect can grasp it. And that's what education is. We are the species on Earth that takes longest to grow up in the way that we, we become students. Become students. Um, we, we can still be studying for PhDs and further stuff in our dotage. It's like you talk about um, difference between German attitudes and British attitudes to Paracelsus. The um, say people say that what is the difference between what is the resemblance between Jesus Christ and a German student? 
because they have perpetual students there, um, that uh, a German student resembles Jesus Christ because he wears sandals, he has a long beard, and whenever he does anything at all, it's called a miracle. <laughs> Wonderful. Are you still learning now then, Paul? Because you've written oh, yes, countless course. books. Of course, of course. I mean, it's, uh, you, uh, you all suffer from, and I certainly deserve to suffer from the imposters, syndrome. Because if you write a book, you do an enormous amount of research for it. So you know it. But um, I've got my book in front of me here. Um, and I'll refer to it. But I don't, I can't remember everything in it. You know, of course not. And, you know, you move on and you focus then on your next book. And that is, I think that's the fate of all writers. You know, they, they go on and they move from one to the next to the next. Well, Paul, anyway, thank you. Me. Thank you so much. It's been fantastic. Great talking to you. And uh, I hope you find some of this some use. I do hope you enjoyed that chat. It certainly opened my eyes to a new era of understanding that revolutionised Europe. Thank you for listening. Plenty more content coming up, including Napoleon's invasion of Russia. If you can, please do recommend this pod to your friends and family and rate and review if you can. It really helps this independent podcast to grow. You'll find links in the show notes. And until next week, thank you and good night.